much. Good morning again. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin this morning. It's good to see everybody, by the way. Happy Sunday morning to you. It's a beautiful Sunday morning. So, uh, Lord, uh, thank you for this beautiful Sunday morning. And thank you for this place. And thank you for this gathering. Thank you for these people, the church. And uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, their, their, their love for one another, uh, their service not only to uh, this body, but to the, the community, Lord. Uh, thank you. Thank you for allowing us to gather together as your people to worship you and praise your name and present those offerings of thanksgiving. We, uh, uh, you're mighty. Uh, you're amazing. Uh, you are uh, our God. Too wonderful for words uh, is the, the gift you, you've given us. We have a Savior, and uh, we have life, and we are so grateful for it. Uh, Lord, help us each and every day to take that life that you've given us and do with it the, you know, the purpose, you know, the mission uh, that you've called us all uh, to do. Uh, we're meant to do uh, great things in your name for your sake, uh, for the sake of the gospel, uh, may it be so. Make us people of courage, make us people of strength, uh, make us people of love and compassion and kindness. Uh, Lord, uh, let us be a people that, you know, others look to and say there, there's something about them, something peculiar that sets them apart, and it's because we belong to you. Amen. And uh, so may your light shine uh, ever bright. Uh, Lord, we pray. It makes uh, an incredible uh, difference, not only in our lives, but in the lives of others around us. Lord, may your spirit uh, guide us through the study of your word this morning, and uh, may all glory and honor be yours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. And uh, this, of course, is uh, the second week of, of Advent, uh, in case you were not here uh, last week, or maybe you were, and you've just uh, forgotten throughout the week. Uh, we had mentioned that that word uh, Advent comes from uh, the Latin word meaning coming or arrival. We know that it, it's been for centuries that the church has celebrated uh, that four-week Advent season by uh, lighting the candles uh, in a wreath and, of course, reflecting on the coming of our Lord and, and Savior Jesus Christ is told in scripture. Uh, so that circle that we have of the wreath uh, represents God's, not only his love, but his never-ending uh, love for us. The greens around the wreath representing Christ's gift of eternal life. And of course, the candles that are being lit around the wreath announcing Jesus as uh, the light of the world. Uh, last week, uh, we lit that first candle, uh, signifying hope. And come on, hope. Uh, we all need it, and uh, we are uh, thankful for that light that brings hope. Uh, this week, uh, a little bit of a reflection on the peace uh, that Christ brings. Uh, that is the second week of Advent. Uh, our text, of course, uh, over these weeks, Isaiah 9-6, says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and you will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and uh, that last designation there, Prince of Peace. And so uh, the verse tells us that Jesus came to be just that, uh, the Prince of Peace, the Master of Wholeness, Right, And, of course, uh, that word peace is the Hebrew word shalom, which means completeness, wholeness, well-being. Uh, Jesus did not only come to end wars, but to make us complete by saving us uh, from our sinfulness. And all we have to do is trust in Jesus as the Son of God who came to save us, and we will have that peace or that shalom of God. 
And, uh, you know, we mentioned, uh, you know, last week, uh, just the beginning of Isaiah chapter 9, where we see those wonderful words, there will be no more gloom, right? A, a light will shine. Uh, and where will it shine? It will shine in the darkness. We do have a choice. We could linger in the darkness. In fact, I, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, our enemy, uh, the devil, uh, along with the world, along with, uh, you know, our own flesh and that weakness there, uh, you know, would have us, uh, you know, remain in that darkness, right? Uh, you know, focusing on our failures, uh, focusing on our shame, uh, focusing on our disgrace, focusing on our fears as well, you know, ha having no peace. But when we focus on the light, right, that radiant, that beautiful light, well, it, it's then uh, that, you know, we, we begin to understand, you know, we truly understand who our Lord and Savior is as Prince of Peace. Uh, you know, he's, he's giving us just that. It's not something that you and I can summon up from within. It's a supernatural peace, a peace that's beyond understanding, right? Amen. And uh, we are uh, grateful for it. As much as I would uh, like to uh, focus on, you know, uh, a little bit more on Prince of Peace this morning, that would be taking me out of order, and it's something this pastor cannot do, <laughs> right? And, you know, it's just something I just can't, uh, you know, bring myself to do. Uh, so we're looking at that, that first name uh, this morning. His name is Wonderful, and, uh, but certainly, um, you know, the light that he is, it brings hope, it brings peace, and uh, we are uh, so grateful for it. Once again, Isaiah 9, 6, for to us, a child is born to us, a son is given, and as we talked about last week, the government will be on his shoulders. We're meant to put, you know, the government of our lives, right, upon his shoulders, or shoulder, right? It only takes one for our Lord, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty, God, Everlasting Father, Prince of, of Peace, and, and, and these... Uh, I, and I, I suppose these, these, des, these designations are not names per se in a literal sense, but they are, as we mentioned last week a little bit, descriptions of the character and the nature of the prophesied Messiah, who is, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ always, always, always lives up to his name, no matter what. He is the wonderful Counselor, And certainly we, as the church, we can't uh, look at the Lord Jesus Christ without considering him as wonderful, right? You know, uh, the glory of who he is and what he's done for us should absolutely fill us with wonder. He will. I mean, if you look upon him, he will fill your heart and your mind with wonder, with amazement, right? Amen. Uh, so why then, uh, you know, is, is there such a lack of wonder and you know there's there's even a lack of, of wonder and uh, an amazement among believers you know among those you know who call themselves Christians Christ's ones why why would there be a lack if our savior is wonderful and he is wonderful you know uh, why are there so many who are simply blind uh, to the wonder that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, you know, maybe something to re reflect on and think upon this morning as we go through uh, the word is, do you uh, still see the, the wonder and amazement uh, of him? Are you still in awe of him? Uh, you know, or, or have you become a little bit bored uh, with Jesus? I, it's even kind of hard to say. Have you become a little bored with Jesus Christ? I don't know how we could. Are you bored with your Christianity? Are you bored with church? Uh, I can tell you that uh, the answer from many is yes, which is why we see so many empty seats. And uh, sadly, and it breaks our hearts uh, to see, you know, uh, especially among young people, uh, especially those... Uh, Entering those uh, teen years and continuing through into their, you know, early uh, adult years, it's uh, it's hard. 
they lose that wonder. However, it is not limited to any age. You know, people of you know, regardless of how long we've been walking with the Lord, and uh, regardless of uh, where we are in terms of age and life, it can happen. Many believers uh, are sadly bored, and they're bored because because they don't see the wonder, the awe, the, the amazement, the astonishment of, of all of this. In First John, uh, chapter one, verses three and four. Uh, John says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. And so throughout 1 John, and I've, I've preached from 1 John uh, in the past, he talks about this fellowship that we can have with, with God as our Father through the Lord Jesus and the uh, uh, the consequential uh, fellowship uh, that we have with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so he talks about how we can enjoy this fellowship and enjoy this sweet communion with God. But then listen to how he ends the letter. Listen to how he ends the epistle. 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Right? Dear, dear, dear children, children of the Lord, you know, keep yourselves from idols. And that's how the epistle ends. And now why does he end it like that? It, it's because an idol is a substitute for God. An idol is something, anything, that comes between us and our communion, our fellowship with God. We're to have this awesome and wonderful and beautiful and intimate fellowship and communion with him, but then an idol is something artificial that takes God's place. Yeah, so maybe, I think, in general anyway, you know, we live in a, a fairly artificial world, right? You know, so much so that, uh, that I think there are, at times, uh, you know, few Christians who are really, you know, we, we just miss it sometimes. We're we're not seeing Christ's wonder, and because of that, you know, many people are accepting substitutes. Even believers are accepting substitutes. They're, they're accepting artificial replacements, which are simply and tragically idols, you know. And, and that explains why there's a, a lust for more than Christ, uh, in, not only in the world today, but sadly uh, you know, at times within the church a a as a whole. Uh, many people are looking for other things. Maybe they're looking for wonderful experiences. Maybe they're looking for a wonderful knowledge, right? They're looking to go to, I mean, uh, let's face it, there are some, per you know, churches and really all they do is put on a wonderful show, you know, this, this grand performance, right? You know, uh, many are, are seeking wonderful abilities and, and, and gifts, there are even those who are looking for wonderful success, right? And it's not that it's not that any of those uh, things in and of themselves are inherently wrong, but but many are seeking the the wonder of these things at the expense of Christ, and that is wrong. You know, it, it, it you know if it's these things that I mentioned and more, if it's those things without intimacy with Jesus, without fellowship, and without communion with God then there's something wrong. And what will happen is, you know, the only thing that can happen, you'll lose the wonder. How can we when he is wonderful, right? You know, that, that's where we need to get our focus again. You know, so when that happens, when we substitute the real for the, for the artificial, there comes a lack of depth and there comes a lack of quality in our Christian experience. And that's not what God would have for us. You know, and, and that's what we're doing if we don't see the wonder of our Lord Jesus. If you choose to worship something artificial, even as a believer, if you come to take wonder from something other and over Christ and Christ alone in all his glory and all the beautiful wonders of his glorious name, you know, the senses that you once found wonder in will just become like the idol that you worship. But if you and I, if we seek Christ as he truly is through a personal 
experience through a personal walk with the Lord himself, an intimacy, a communion, a fellowship, then uh, I think, of course, we're going to see his wonder. Of course we will. And we'll begin to appreciate him. And, and more so, like the Bible says, we'll become more like him. And that's a beautiful thing. So uh, what's, you know, you know let, let's, let's go into it a little deeper. What's this wonder that we're, that we're talking about uh, this morning? It, you know, really, it's a wonder that brings a, a depth of, of, uh, of meaning with it. So this, this wonder enriches us. This wonder changes us. It's really to be overwhelmed in a good way. It's to be overwhelmed with an appreciation of Jesus Christ, uh, much like Peter was when he fell uh, at the feet of Jesus' knees and said in Luke chapter 5, verse 8, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Those were the words. He fell to his knees, right? Right? He fell before Jesus. Go, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. You know, do we have an appreciation of the Lord Jesus like Peter had? You know, what do we need to appreciate? Well, uh, a lot. Uh, certainly, we have to appreciate his birth, right? We are in the season where we are reflecting upon this beautiful and miraculous and lovely birth, the wonder of his miraculous conception, the, all the wonder uh, of the circumstances surrounding his birth, the wonder of the Magi uh, coming and worshiping him, the wonder of the, the shepherds and the wonder of the reaction of the people to the birth of the Lord Jesus. Luke chapter 2, uh, verse 18 says, All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. They were all astounded and amazed at what the shepherds had told them because there was wonder. There was amazement and astonishment at the birth of the king of Israel. And then, of course, not only the wonder of his birth that we're considering during this time, but also the wonder of his life, the wonder of his very life. Because Jesus, in his life and in his ministry, he turned the ordinary to the extraordinary, right? You know, what wonder there is in all of his miracles. Think upon just some of the miracles even that we were talking about as we were going through that portion of the Gospel of Mark, right? And I mean, it's just astounding what our Lord Jesus was able to do. He touched blind eyes and, and he made them see uh, deaf ears and made them hear. He, he touched those, uh, those mute, those dumb tongues and suddenly they could speak. They could talk. He restored a withered hand. Who does that but our Lord Jesus? He turned water into wine. He walked on water. He fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Our Lord Jesus Christ even raised the dead. You tell me that that's not wonderful. Everything Jesus touched, he made wonderful. Everything. Everything. It's, it, you know, not only were his, uh, his, his works wonderful but we also know that his words were wonderful his words you know they wondered all people wondered at his words in Luke chapter 4 we read that the eyes of all those in in the synagogue were attentively fixed on him verse 22 of Luke chapter 4 I'm reading uh, Bruce from the Amplified uh, Luke chapter 4 verse 22 the text says they were all they were speak they were all speaking well of him I can't talk but they were all speaking well of him and were in awe and were wondering about the words of grace which were coming from his lips. I mean, look at that. He spoke with divine authority. His words were infused with power and his words were absolutely infused with life. Uh, when on the night uh, in which he was betrayed, uh, Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 26, um, the text tells us that Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body now you don't look at the wonder in his words here look what he's saying as, as he's breaking the bread you know take and eat this is my body and, and then he took a cup 
And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Concluding there in verse 28. So this, this is our Jesus who took ordinary bread and ordinary wine, and he endows them with sacred significance that was never before known by mankind. The wonder of his life. The wonder of his words, all of this, it led to the wonder of the cross. And he goes to the cross and he turned that ordinary means of execution into the greatest symbol of God's love that humankind has ever known. You know, everything he touched, everything, everything, he made it wonderful. That's our Lord. You know, and, and it's hard because we, we are very familiar with the cross. <coughs> And we lose the wonder of that even at times, you know, you know, whether or not, you know, whether it's when we come to the table uh, for commute to observe communion and remember him or whether, you know, it's, it's in the gospel or whether or whether it's in the songs we sing or the reading of the word of God and in, in whatever your daily experience is there, we we come across the cross, <laughs> right? And we've heard about it and meditated on it so much before, and perhaps it loses its wonder, but it shouldn't. Not in our lives uh, as believers. The wonder of his birth, the wonder of his life, the wonder of these miracles, his words. Uh, but, I mean, come on. Have you lost the wonder of the resurrection? I hope not. You know, the greatest miracle of all time is that Christ comes forth. So here he is, the author of a new creation, never to die again, offering eternal life to those who believe in him. You can't lose the wonder in that. Not just a spiritual resurrection, but a bodily, physical resurrection. And then he goes, you know, 40 days later to his ascension. And as a human being, I can't explain it. He enters heaven and he is enthroned right there on the throne of God in heaven and becomes, he becomes our great high priest and he intercedes for us. What else can you say? But he is wonderful. He is wonderful. You know, you know if you're here this morning and, and maybe you know, we're kind of going through this and maybe you're actually realizing, hey, I have lost a little bit of the wonder here. You know, I want to, I want to know more of this in my experience more of the awe and, and the amazement and, and the astonishment all of it I want it back in my heart well I can't give it to you you know but I, here's here's what you can do and I can do it as well we ask God for it Amen. what else can we do friends we have to ask God for it Ask God for the Holy Spirit to show you the wonder of Jesus. Because that's the Holy Spirit's job. The Holy Spirit's job is not, you know, not, not to focus on himself, but to shine that spotlight on the one whom God is fully delighted with, and that's his one, his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 26, uh, I'm reading from the Amplified again, Bruce, John 15, 26. But when the Helper, that's the Holy Spirit, the Helper, that is, the Comforter, Advocate, Intercessor, Counselor, Strengthener, Standby, all there we see in parentheses, comes when that Helper, the Holy Spirit, comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of Truth who comes from the Father, he will testify and he'll bear witness about me, the Lord says, right? So you and I, as believers, as a church, we can ask God the Father for the Holy Spirit to show us the wonder that only the Holy Spirit can give. The Holy Spirit will illuminate it for us, shining that light on our Lord Jesus. And the Holy Spirit can give us that deep appreciation of Jesus Christ in his glory and we can just hopefully have it shouting from our hearts again he is wonderful he's wonderful you know but he is not just wonderful right what is going back to Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 you know wonderful 
He is wonderful counselor, right? The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have been in counsel. This is, and friends, I mean, if you're talking about wonder, and if you're talking about awe and amazement and astonishment and all this, you have to imagine God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit counseling together. They've counseled together concerning our salvation, and it was their counsel that put forth that perfect plan of God to save us who are here today. You know, the Godhead, in counsel, conceived that the Father should send and that the Son should come and that the Holy Spirit should implement all of it, convicting the world of, of sin and testifying to the minds and hearts of unbelieving people about the wonder of Jesus Christ. We know this because the Bible tells us. John chapter 16, verse 8, it tells us that that's what the Spirit does. Not making it up. It's an awesome truth. They are counseling together for our good. And we have to believe that God is sovereign. We have to believe that God is in control. We have to. We must believe it, you know, that whatever you're going through this morning, what, 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 whatever it is, though you may not fully understand what God has been bringing you uh, f from, and you don't fully understand where, you know, where you're going to, for that matter, right? You know, he knows what he's doing. We have to believe that he knows what he's doing, that he's sovereign, that he's in control. You know, he's counseling for your good and for my good and for his glory. Do we believe that? Yeah. You know, many, uh, you know, a, a lot of people are, are, are seeking uh, guidance uh, in their lives or, or help in dealing with the, the burdens and with the loads uh, that they carry. And, you know, I'm not going to diminish anything. You know, there are people who have heavy loads and terrible, heavy burdens. And, you know, and uh, those things will turn, you know, uh, you know they'll, they'll turn to a great many uh, people and uh, they'll turn to a great many uh, things uh, for help and for guidance. You know, but, but friends, you know, the truth is that Jesus is the one. He is the wonderful one who is fit to guide our lives. Amen. He is that wonderful counselor. You know, when, when, whatever you're going through, when your back is up against the wall, and that's it. When you have a problem, when there's a crisis, you know, we should seek the Lord. Because the counsel that he offers is unlike any other. I mean, come on. You know, the world... We have a world that will always offer its counsel, right? Always. But where there's the world, there's the flesh. Can we agree on that? You know, and where, so if where there's the world, there's the flesh that counsels us toward selfishness, toward comfort, toward ease and indulgence of every appetite and passion without any restraint. That's not good counsel. You know, but the word of God says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? So the heart's deceitful. The heart's unstable. But also the mind is very limited. God's word is very clear. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 9. Isaiah 55, 9. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So that means that no matter what counsel we receive from the world and from our flesh, or even from the intellects of, of others, it's not enough. It's not enough. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, Jeremiah 10, verse 23, I'm uh, I'm reading again uh, from the Amplified Bruce. Uh, the prophet says, O oh Lord, I know that the path of a life of a man is not in himself. It is not within the limited ability of a man, even one at his best, to choose and direct his steps in life. 
heed those words, friends, for the best of us. <laughs> the best of us, right? Even when we're at our very best. You know, it is not within our limited abilities to choose and direct the steps in our lives. We need a guide. We need a counselor. And the, the, and, and the only counsel that is unlike any other is, uh, you know, that that comes from our wonderful counselor. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if the world gives its advice and the flesh in us and in others gives its advice, then you can be absolutely sure that Satan and his demons will give their advice as well. And they are happy to give it. You know, the enemy has an objective, right? You know, he doesn't want you and I to see the wonder of Jesus Christ. And he will do everything in his power to prevent us from seeing it. You know, we have to understand that. He seeks to do what? You know, what does the Bible tell us? He, tell, you know, he seeks to deceive and he seeks to destroy. If he can rob you and I of the awe and the wonder that we once had, in our Lord and in our Savior and in all these things that we're talking about this morning, then he's, you know, he's reached the objective that he set. And he'll give us all sorts of counsel, by the way. The enemy is not afraid to give us all sorts of counsel if we'll heed it. But, the, you know, we have the wonderful counselor. This is the good news in that. We have the wonderful counselor as believers. You don't need the world and you don't need the flesh. And I would, you, don't, you certainly don't need to be heeding the, you know, the words and the counsel of the devil. Tragically, there are many in the world who just heed all that counsel. They just listen to the lust of their own flesh. They seek you know, worldly counsel you know, that leads them in the direction of comfort and ease and selfishness, self-indulgence. And then tragically, of course, we see many, even those we love, who are close to us, just heed the words of the enemy. But, you know, friends, we, we have that wonderful counselor. We need to understand that the Lord Jesus, you know, as the wonderful counselor is just a privilege of the new covenant. You know, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 11, uh, in Hebrews 8, 11, the author is quoting Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34, uh, and it's one of the promises in the new covenant. Uh, Hebrews 8, verse 11, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. You know, and so... You know, are, are you capturing what that means there, friends? You know, this there, there's a personal intimacy and fellowship of communion with the Lord Jesus Christ in the new covenant. And as believers in him, we have a wonderful, and capture this, we have, not only have a wonderful, but a personal counselor. This is a relationship. Right? You and I, you know, we come here, but part of our study of this, this, this is all to bring us closer to him, right? We, we want to have that richer and deeper and more intimate relationship with Christ Jesus our Lord. We want to walk closer with him, and we want to have a, a richer and more beautiful talk with him. We want all of that, and we, we want this communion and fellowship to be strengthened. We, you know, it, we just, he is wonderful. But how does he counsel us? Well, he counsels us through the word of God, friends. You know, uh, are you reading the word of God? We read in Psalm 119, verse 24, Psalm 119, 24. And uh, I do want to say, you know, Bruce, Bruce is not feeling his best today, but he's being fantastic back there just uh, helping just thank you Bruce and uh, do pray for your you know uh, for your healing there my friend uh, Psalm 119 24 we're familiar with this your statutes are my delight they are my counselors 
They are. Through the word of God, we have the wonderful counselor of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we also receive counsel when we come to hear the preaching of the word of God in the power and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. You know, and you know, as we read our Bibles, if you're in your Bible daily, first of all, fantastic. You know, uh, you know but, but there's often, okay, so you go to the Bible, you're reading the Bible, you know, daily. And there's often a personal application for you as you're reading it. This personal application of scripture to us as we're reading the word of God. So how, how many of you have had that experience where the word of God just seems to just leap? It just jumps out of the page and it just speaks right to you in, in the midst of some circumstance that you're going through. I know you have because a lot of you come and tell me. I, I, you know, uh, th there's so many, even in our, just our little uh, assembly, you come to me and you tell me just that. And it's wonderful. Amen. It absolutely is. There are occasions where you and I need a verse, where you and I need a word from God, and the Spirit reminds us of things that we've learned and things that we've read in the past. They're right there for us. And that's wonderful. And that's counsel. It, it, it's, it's an incredible thing. And, uh, you know, through the word of God, we have God's counsel. But the word of God is not the only way that God speaks to us. It's not the only way that God counsels us. Because he can also counsel us through our circumstances, right? You know, as, as believers, God's spirit, praise God, God's spirit resides and dwells within us, yes? Amen. So we ought to expect if we have the Holy Spirit within us, then as believers we should and ought to expect to hear an inner voice from God. That's the Spirit. You know, do you receive the counsel of the Lord Jesus Christ through the witness of the Holy Spirit with your spirit? That is the human spirit, you know, that God breathed into us, right? You know, some, uh, I don't know, some people call it like uh, some sort of like internal intuition, a knowing of the, of, of the will of God. It's, a, it's an impulse or it's an impression that comes to us and it tells us that something is right or that something, uh, you know, is wrong. And it might come in a word, uh, it might come in a thought, uh, or maybe even, you know, our, our Lord is not without feeling, right? And he, it can certainly come through that. And uh, the thing is that Jesus can help you with your problems, big and small. Amen. And uh, Jesus can help you with your decisions, great and small. He can. The wonderful counselor is there for you. He's there for me. He's there for the church. You know, and if, you know, if you were here last week, if you, as we said last week, if you put the government of your life upon his shoulder... You know, he'll make this real to you. He will. And he will guide you. Um, so, you know, if, if you're thinking about what the witness of the Holy Spirit is internally, um, in the Old Testament, there's a wonderful illustration of this. If we're thinking about this internal witness uh, of the Holy Spirit. So in the Old Testament, uh, you know, God sometimes spoke through the high priest using uh, two stones that were called the Urim and the Thummim. Okay? And you can read about the Urim and the Thummim. There's not a lot about that. They're only briefly mentioned. However, they are briefly mentioned in, in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, 1 Samuel, and then you see them again in Ezra and Nehemiah. So they are mentioned uh, sporadically there throughout the Old Testament. Uh, not too much said about them, but, but they're there. And, uh, you know, and anyway, I believe in a sense it corresponds uh, to that New Testament witness of the Spirit. These two stones were contained in a pouch uh, that were placed behind uh, the breastplate, uh, breastplate of the high priest, which was very close to his heart. And when there was a need for uh, divine guidance or uh, a decision on behalf of the people, so the priest would look behind his breastplate and he would peek into the pouch 
behind the breastplate to see if the Urim glowed. And if the glow was present, he knew that the Lord was speaking and saying, yes. And so in, in that sense, that glow was a, a type of, you might say, an inner burning. Uh, it, right? It, if there was no glow, then he knew that God was uh, you know, speaking not to take action. Now, in saying that, please don't misunderstand the Urim and the Thummim. Or the witness of the spirit, for that matter. Don't, we don't want to misunderstand it because it's not some sort of automatic mechanism that you can switch on and off at will, right? And, and I, let me demonstrate that quick, too, because I don't want to lead you in the wrong direction. Saul found this out in the Old Testament, in his, you know, and he found it out to his own detriment. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, uh, you do need to see this. 1 Samuel chapter 28, the Philistines were coming against the king, and Saul didn't know what to do. Right? He had no idea. So he inquired of the, law, uh, of the Lord in 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 6, tells us that the Lord did not answer him by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. So look at this. Look at his impulsive response in verse 7 of 1 Samuel chapter 28. Well, Saul then said to his attendants, okay, find me a woman who's a medium so I may go and inquire of her. So, you know, he, he inquired of the medium. He inquired of the witch at Endor, right? And so the reason why that inner burning witness didn't work for Saul was because he wasn't walking in agreement with God. We have to understand that, right? So, friends, if you're wanting guidance, here's the point. If you're wanting guidance and you're just craving wisdom from God, you can't switch it on and off. None of us can. You have to be seeing and appreciating the wonder of Christ. For Saul, that wasn't happening. And we could tell that by his response. Well, we'll just, you know, we'll just go to the occult and see. That should work, right? What an impulse. Hopefully that's not ours. You know, we don't receive a word from Christ right away. And, right? Hopefully our impulses don't take us right to the world or to the enemy. Anyway. Warren Worsby said his words, uh, God doesn't give his counsel to the curious or the careless. He reveals his will to the concerned and the consecrated. And I think it's very instructive. Worsby's words there, right? He doesn't give his counsel to the curious or careless, but rather to the concerned and the consecrated, you know. Uh, you know, listen, we all, if we're, if we're believers in Christ, we want to know what God's will is, right? You know, we certainly do. And there are things in Scripture that you just cannot find guidance for. God reveals his will for the purpose of obedience. In the Christian life, uh, obedience is that instrument of revelation. It is. If you want to know the will of God in your life, what to be and where to go, you need to be obedient in what God's already showing you. It goes for us individually, but also as a body, right? Of believers. Guidance is based on a relationship with the guide. We have to have that relationship. And counsel is based on a relationship with the wonderful counselor. It's all about that relationship. Some people want to, you know, want God to say, well, you know, Jim... You know, go ahead and uh, take that next left turn. And then, you know, when you get to the intersection, bear right. And then continue on 900 feet. And there on your left will be the very decision that you need to make. Right? Or there, or right on the corner, will be the very place where you need to be. Yeah? Or, and then don't forget, you know, you can go right to that spot and you will find the, that career that you need to follow. You know, it doesn't work like that. You know, like Saul, you know, we just try to switch it on and off and it doesn't work. Because, you know, we, we're not pursuing a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what we need. And that's why, you know, a lot of people sadly don't have that guidance because they want all... The answers to their questions but they're not prepared to pursue the guide and you can't have a fellowship my friends at all with that GPS 
There's no relationship that you can have with it. It'll tell you where to go, kind of. And often steer us in the wrong direction. Recalculate. Recalculate. And sometimes in a different voice. But we can't have a relationship with it. And uh, that's the key. And we have to have a relationship, a personal one, with our God and with our counselor. God is more interested in who you are in relation to him. He is than what you become or, or where you become him. Guidance is based on relationship, seeing and appreciating the wonder of who Christ really is. And it, it involves some things on our part. It does involve for us, it involves daily <coughs> repentance, and it involves daily surrender, and it involves a humble and prayerful dependence upon God. Amen. And a faithful one, for that matter. So, um, I'm going to conclude this, but James uh, really exhorts us in uh, James uh, chapter 1, verse 5, reading from the Amplified again, Bruce, James 1, 5, if any of you lacks wisdom to guide him through a decision or circumstance, he is to ask of our benevolent God who gives to everyone generously and without rebuke or blame. And guess what? Look what it says there. It will be given to him. Amen. It will be given to him. You know, I, I don't, and again, as, as I conclude this this morning, don't, don't misunderstand me. I mean, you, you do need at times, and uh, you know, godly counselors, and um, you know, if you need to seek out help, you know, and if you're really in need, you know, you know, and you feel like you need to seek out a godly counselor, you know, don't don't misunderstand this this morning and not do that, you know, uh, and and absolutely, certainly, the Lord will minister to us in His counsel. You know, his wonder and his grace and his love, he'll do that through the body of Christ, right? When, you know, and he'll do that because we're his arms and, and, and we're his, his feet, right? You know, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying this morning and, you know, think that you can't go to your brother and sister in Christ. Please do. But we also, with that in mind, you know, if you're needing help, Always remember that you do have always a competent and compassionate and continuous and a confidential counselor right in your heart. And he is, as we read this morning in Isaiah 9, 6, he is wonderful. He is wonderful. And I do pray that our hearts and our minds will be filled with awe and with wonder and with amazement and with astonishment at all of this. May we not lose the wonder of his glorious name, of all his wonderful works and words, of the touch, that beautiful touch that changed the ordinary into the extraordinary. May not one of us lose the wonder of his birth, of the cross, of his life and ministry, of his death and resurrection. And of what he's doing for us right now as our great high priest. May we not lose the wonder of what's coming. Uh, so much. Let's uh, remember, uh, you know, if you feel like, you know, you are, it's kind of slipping from you. Very clearly, ask God for it. Ask him for it. You know, the Holy Spirit is present with you and he will shine a light on our Lord and Savior for you. We need him illuminated again. And uh, Lord, I can't ask, I can't ask for everyone here, but I do pray that we will. We'll seek you and we'll ask for you. If we feel like we've lost it, like things have become a little boring, um, it, I, the things of this world uh, can easily and certainly distract us. You know, our, uh, our own flesh, our own fleshly desires can really guide us more toward 
self-interest, self-indulgence, and comfort, and, and ease, and all those things. And of course the world will counsel us in, in that direction as well. To seek only pleasures for ourselves. And uh, Lord, uh, we know that uh, our enemy would uh, seek to uh, rob us of uh, all the wonder and, and awe. And, and, you know, none of us here are immune to following things and looking upon things and, you know, with more wonder than we, we, we look upon you with. It, 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 it's tragic. And I, I, if we need to be refocused, Lord, I do pray that we would come and seek you for it. We're not going to find it anywhere else. And that your spirit would just guide us and, and illuminate and shine that light upon our precious Lord and upon that precious blood that flowed upon that precious sacrifice that was made in love and in goodness and in kindness and in grace and in mercy for us. And, and that we would just once again, just our eyes would be open to the wonder of it all, to the fact that we do have a wonderful counselor with us. And I don't know, again, there are no words to thank you enough for this. So uh, I, I pray for, you know, I, I don't know, Lord, personally, all the struggles and, and all the burdens and you know, all the loads that these good people are carrying. They're carrying some that are that are small, a little bit lighter, and some are carrying others that are that are greater, and and just so so heavy. And uh, Lord, you know each and every one. You know each and every one. And uh, you ask that you each and all of us would just bring those things to you. You know, to bring them to your feet. I wouldn't want any of us to just simply stumble around in the darkness carrying these loads, but rather to just come into the light and to lay them at your feet, Lord. Um, but in all these things, Lord, uh, I, I pray that these, uh, the, your people, you know, they, they would look and know you as wonderful and know you as counselor and know you as mighty God and know you as father of eternity and know you as prince of peace and, and uh, may these things bring hope and peace and joy and love and light into their lives I pray in Jesus name Amen and uh, of course